And welcome to Nat Chat for Saturday, April 13th, 2024, what you might call Service Time Day 2024. Perhaps it will prove to be James Wood Day 2024, along with MassInSports.com Nationals insider Mark Zuckerman, who was at Oakland Coliseum, where the official attendance late night on Friday night was 5,777. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. The final score of game one of a three-game series for the Nats at the Oakland A's was A's two, Nats one in 10 innings. But you also could say that the final score was Lawrence Butler two, Jesse Winker one in 10 innings because Butler drove in each of Oakland's two runs. And Winker, in so many ways, was the Nats offense in this game. Jesse Winker was tremendous. Four for four, big solo homer, a double and two singles. But Trey Lipscomb committed a bit of a base running blunder in the top of the 10th. Kyle Finnegan gave up a walk-off one out opposite field RBI single by Lawrence Butler uh, to left field on a one-two pitch. And the Nats fell to five and eight in this regular season. We have a shout out coming up later in the show. Email Tim Shovers if you want to send a shout out on the Nats Chat Podcast to someone who you care about. The email address is Nats Chat Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, also, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, just search Nats Chat. Our YouTube handle is at Nats Chat Podcast. And please click on the thumbs up button. And uh, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. It uh, doesn't cost you a thing and helps us out a lot. Uh, Mark, you on this uh, Nationals nine-game trip out west have gone from the palace that is Oracle Park in San Francisco to the, uh, shall we say, non-palace uh, that is Oakland Coliseum, have your baseball sensibilities properly adjusted to the change in venue? No, Al, I think it's going to take all weekend before I, I get used to it, of course. Uh, yeah, I'm staring out at Mount Davis right now, way out there, all tarped up. Uh, speaking of tarps, there's a tarp on the infield right now because they're expecting rain all day Saturday, which could make for a very unpleasant situation. Uh, hopefully not a doubleheader on Sunday, but I guess we'll deal with that whenever we get there. But it was strange coming here. I've been here a few times before. It hasn't changed at all over the years. Um, but it was sad knowing that this is their their last year here. And whatever you think about the the ultimate decision of whether to stay in Oakland or go to Sacramento for a few years or eventually the Las Vegas, and you have to feel for the fan base here. This is a proud franchise with some great history and not just in little spurts here or there, but like they won three straight titles in the 70s, you had the great teams of the late 80s and early 90s, and then you had consistently good teams in the 2000s as well that would make the playoffs and then just never made it back to the World Series. And I know you you cited that attendance number. You know, it was really bad to see that in person like that. Um, uh, but I know there's a fan base here. If uh, this was a quality team, a quality product being put out there and in a better facility, I have no doubt that they could be successful here, and it's it's unfortunate and sad for all of them that they're not going to ever get the opportunity to prove that's true. Yeah, I don't see the A's leaving as some glaring indictment of A's fans. Uh, the Oakland A's situation has been going on for many years. It is multi-layered. It is complicated. We're not here to do a deep dive on it, but uh, there's a lot more to it than, oh, the fans aren't good enough. Like, no, uh, it's a lot more complex than that. Well, uh, a lot of different things happened in this game on Friday night, but there was a big time positive, and that was Jake Irvin. Uh, Jake Irvin had been so so at best over his first two starts uh, of this regular season, but Irvin on Friday night was quite good. Now, yes, you have to consider the opposition, and yes, you also have to consider the ballpark. Uh, the Oakland Col Coliseum is known uh, as a pitcher's park, but Irvin in this game, one run in six innings, and he gave up one hit. Uh, now, the one hit was a uh, sizable home run uh, by Lawrence Butler uh, on a bottom to right field in the bottom of the third for a one nothing A's lead, 445 feet for StatCast. But Irvin had five strikeouts versus two walks, uh, only threw 74 pitches, 44 strikes, 30 balls. But he looked a lot better than he had looked over his previous two starts. So the 6-5 walk-off loss at the Cincinnati Reds on uh, March 31st, three runs, five innings. The 5-2 loss to the Philadelphia Phillies at Nationals Park. Uh, last Saturday, April 6th, four runs in six innings. Uh, Irvin, given the Nats what they need, especially with Josiah Gray out for who knows how long, you're going to need Irvin and Mackenzie Gore to do well, and Irvin on Friday night did do well. Yeah, he was outstanding. I think that the most telling stat of that is he never had to pitch out of the stretch until the fifth inning because the only base runner through the first four 
was Butler who hit the home run. And so he trots around the bases and now Jake Irvin is still pitching out of the windup after that. He was really efficient. You mentioned the low pitch count, attacking hitters, was getting swings and misses, getting called third strikes. Uh, I thought this was a really, really good outing by him and he deserved a whole lot better than to come out of the game and have one hit to his name and be trailing. Uh, if he had taken the loss, he didn't in the end because of the Winker homer. But if he had taken the loss, he would have been only the third starting pitcher in Nationals history to take a loss after giving up one hit in a game. And the other two, this is an odd couple if ever there was one, Steven Strasburg and Odalis Perez. The only thing those two had in common is they both started opening day once for the Nationals. Well, Strasburg did a lot more than once. Otherwise, those two had nothing else in common, except they both took a loss with uh, on a day when they only gave it one hit. Uh, do you think Davey Martinez was tempted to keep Urban in the game beyond the six innings, given that he only threw 74 pitches? He was. That was initially the plan when the sixth ended. And then what happened was the top of that inning was really prolonged. The A's made two pitching changes. It was really chilly here and windy, the dugout. And Davey felt like it wasn't worth taking the the chance to push that after he had sat on, uh, on the dugout steps for quite a while. Uh, and they had all three of their top the late inning relievers were available and ready. Jordan Weems, Hunter Harvey, Kyle Finnegan. We saw them go to all of them as the game played out. So a little different circumstances. I think he would have let him go back out for the seventh, but the delay there was just too long. They figured it wasn't worth it. So we'll get to the bullpen in a bit, but yeah, the Nationals offense in this game, if you get anything resembling a good offensive performance, this is probably an easy win for the Nats. Uh, but the Nats in this game, all kinds of problems with the A starter, Paul Blackburn, who tossed six in the third scoreless innings. The Nats for the game, eight hits, uh, three walks, struck out 10 times, went 0 for 10 with runners in scoring position. And yet we did have a very impressive singular offensive performance. And by Jesse Winker, who has become a real bright spot for the Nats uh, so far this season. Winker on Friday night as the Nats starting left fielder and number five batter, four for four. He in the top of the second had a single through the right side of the infield, uh, despite having been down at 1.02. Top of the fourth, a two-out full count hustle double to right field. Top of the seventh, a leadoff single to center field. And then the biggest hit of all, uh, Jesse Winker in a Nationals one-run ninth, a game-tying leadoff full count home run to right field to tie the game at one, uh, despite having been down at 1.12. Now, <laughs> if you are being objective about things, the homer came one pitch after a called ball three that should have been a strike three, but whatever. Winker prolonged the at-bat, hit the home run. I thought this was an odd game for the Nats offensively because they were putting guys on base. Like, there were very few clean innings for A's pitching in this game. So I kind of felt like the Nats were going to score at some point. It felt like one of these innings was bound to be an inning in which the Nats scored a run. Uh, and sure enough, they get that run in the ninth inning. But, man, Jesse Winker has really done a good job. I mean, his guy signed to a minor league contract, non-roster invite to Major League Spring Training. Wasn't signed until February 13th. And Winker now on the season, a 5'11 on base, a 5'28 slugging percentage. Yeah, I think going into the season, if you had said, okay, which of these two non-roster signings is probably going to have the better year, Eddie Rosario or Jesse Winker, I would have said Rosario. I think most would have just on the track record uh, of recent years. Winker was good a few years back in Cincinnati, but not so much the last mm, couple of years, actually. And Rosario pretty consistently good. Now, it's only 13 games in, so we'll see how this plays out. But Winker has been outstanding for them, and those were good quality at-bats against, obviously, a tough starting pitcher. Paul Blackburn, um, this wasn't just a case of the Nats making this guy look like a Cy Young award winner. He has not given up a run yet this year. It's now up to uh, 19 and a third innings, I think, scoreless for him over the course of the season. Uh, he's a veteran. He's not a, a, a young up-and-comer or anything like that. Winker had faced him a good number of times, and I thought it was interesting. He said he's long since since learned not to try to outthink Blackburn. I guess he's very much a try to surprise you with this or that and do things that you're not expecting uh, out there. And Winker decided, I can't do that anymore. I guess he had tried that in the past and was not successful. So he just tried to read and react whatever was being thrown to him. Obviously, it worked because he was four for four in the game, and the rest of the team, I think, had four hits, all of them combined. Uh, so they needed this. And, you know, you mentioned – uh, potential as a call-up day for James Wood. I, number one, I don't think that's happening yet anyways, not while they're out on the West Coast and have a quick turnaround to a day game 
on Saturday. But whatever you think about this, Jesse Winker is playing well enough to deserve to stay in the lineup. That's not to say that he's ultimately a better player than James Wood will be, but you're probably not going to make that move until James Wood is tearing it up at AAA, which he is, and something happens at the big league level to create an opening, whether it's one of these guys struggling or somebody getting hurt. Right now, Jesse Winker deserves to keep playing for the time being. Well, and you think about Nationals outfielders at the major league level so far this season. You have two guys on the 10-day injury list, Don Garrett, Victor Robles. You have Lang Thomas, who was doing well for a few games there, but overall has not had a very good season and has cooled off over these last few games. The aforementioned Eddie Rosario really hasn't done much yet. I mean, the Nats' best outfielder offensively, and you could argue defensively with the outfield assist, has been Jesse Winker. Like, he really has stood out. He has been very productive, and uh, you don't even have to think about it. Like, who's been the Nats' best outfielder so far this season? It's Jesse Winker. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, again, maybe they thought that Rosario or Senzel uh, or somebody else was their best hope to get off to a good start to the year and have some trade value in July. Well, at the moment, a long way to go. But at the moment, Jesse Winker is the one who may have the most value. So keep him out there. Get what you can from him uh, until the time comes to make a move there. But it, it, it's it been nice to see. Um, I know a lot of people who follow him over his career are really happy for him because they believe this is a guy who has always had the ability to be a really good player and then had some tough times the last few seasons. He lost weight, we've talked about, down 25 pounds. And he's playing a complete game for them right now. And I'm not sure a lot of people would have expected that uh, two and a half weeks ago when the season began. Well, another on the cheap free agent signing by the Nats uh, was Joey Gallo. And you would hope that Joey Gallo will ultimately prove to have some trade value. Joey Gallo got ejected uh, from this game. Um, this was pretty much like a low drama ejection. There wasn't like a big scene or anything like that. But uh, Gallo on Friday night, starting first baseman, number three batter, 0 for 3 with a walk and two strikeouts. Uh, he was ejected from the game after striking out looking for the second out in the top of the eighth. Uh, now, all three of the strikes in the plate appearance were called strikes, uh, but all three were legitimate strikes, at least off what I saw. I mean, this was not like some uh, egregious case of, you know, terrible umpiring. Uh, was anything said post game by either Davey or Gallo about the ejection? No, uh, other than uh, Davey said that, you know, he was upset about the, the call and Davey tried to intervene, but it was too late. By the time that he did not, I agree. I didn't think anything of it as he strikes out and goes back to the, the dugout and I'm not paying any attention. And then all of a sudden the next inning starts and Trey Lipscomb had taken his position at third. And then all of a sudden he comes jogging in and Ildemaro Vargas replaces him. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, something happened with Lipscomb. How come Vargas is in at third? And then you realize, no, Lipscomb was just trading in his glove for a first baseman's mitt to go there. And then you realize... I think Joey Gallo got ejected and Davey was yelling from the dugout steps at that point. So I think whatever it was he said may not have even come until the inning was over. I don't know if they caught it at all. Masson uh, saw any of the video of it, but I think it may not have even happened until after the inning was over with and why Gallo decided then maybe just getting some frustration out. I don't know. There were some bad calls during the course of the game that went against them. And as you said, some that went against the A's as well. But that particular at bat, I, I thought he actually called those pitches the correct way. So. Players in dugouts have iPads, right, or tablets uh, by which they can look at calls in just concluded plate appearances. It looked, from what I saw on Masson, that uh, that Gallo was looking at a tablet in the dugout, and that might have prompted him to say something to the umpire. But again, if you go off like the strike zone plots, <laughs> these were strikes. I mean, I don't know what to, I don't know what to say. Like, I don't know what he what he was upset about necessarily. Uh, you mentioned Trey Lipscomb. So, you know, again, we've talked about this previously with these base running blunders by the Nats. When you don't hit, these things really get magnified. Uh, Lipscomb was the Nats' automatic runner on second base to begin the top of the 10th inning. He attempted to take third base on a leadoff first pitch ground out by C.J. Abrams. Abrams, by the way, did not have a good game on Friday night. 0 for 5 with three strikeouts. Uh, first pitch swinging, grounds out to the ace first baseman, uh, Tyler Nevin. And then Lipscomb takes off for third base and Nevin throws across the diamond, easily gets Lipscomb out at third base for a 3-5 double play. Now, this was a bit of an odd play in that the grounder initially maybe looked like a line drive. And so it was um, you know, perhaps a bit confusing. 
but whatever. Uh, that was painful to see. I don't know if you categorize that as a toot bland by Trey Lipscomb, but that certainly was a costly out that was made by Trey Lipscomb. Yeah, more the latter, I think, than the former, because it was, you know, a, a tough play. But the, the key there, and, and Trey admitted it himself at the end of the night, is once you freeze, just go back to second. There's no reason to try to force that issue. You can still score the go-ahead run if you just wait uh, for your next hitter to possibly do something. So, you know, it would be one out and a runner on second. You still have a great opportunity uh, to score there. And that's the kind of thing that I think you have to consider also when you're in extra innings that it's a different ball game now. Uh, you are precious out there at second base in extra innings as the automatic runner. And when you are the visiting team in those situations, extra innings, I think it's magnified even more. You basically have to score in the top of the inning because if not, you can now lose the game without really doing anything wrong. Uh, you can lose the game with a, a sack bunt and a sack fly game over. Now, that's not exactly what happened in this case, but it can. And so I think the pressure in those extra innings is all on the visiting team to get at least that one runner in. And if you are that runner, you have to recognize how important it is. And unless you are 100% sure you're going to make it to third, just hold up. You're still in scoring position. No harm done if you hold up there. I think even if he goes on contact, he might be thrown out because the ball was hit right towards first base. And I think first base could have stepped on and at least made a decent throw to get him. So maybe earlier in a game, you treat that a little differently. But to me, in extra innings, in that case, understand the value of your being on second base in the first place and don't run into any outs. Keep yourself there and let the next guy try to drive you in. Yeah, it was not a great game for the Nats on the base pass. We had what happened with Lipscomb in the 10th inning. Uh, Lane Thomas in this game, top of the third, a two-out infield single on a weak chopper to the left side of the infield, but he then was caught on an attempted steal of second base for the third out. And Joey Manessis, who did have a hit in this game, uh, he needs all the hits he can get right now. One for four with a single, but uh, top of the second, leadoff single to center field, and then he got thrown out at home uh, on a one-out fielder's choice grounder off the bat of Riley Adams. So again, you know, if, if you score six runs, you hit three home runs, we're not talking about these things, but these things happen and they stand out in a 2 one 10 inning loss. Well, and for all the praise that they were getting for their base running <laughs> leading up to this, I wrote about it myself on the off day. Uh, this was not a good base running game for them at all. On the Manessas play, you know, he was called safe and he he was adamant. He, he slid in and he signaled safe very forcefully, believing he was in. I've watched the replay like 10 times. They kept showing it over and over because that was a really long review. I personally didn't see anything in the review that conclusively said he was out. He may have been out, but I felt like that was a case where the original call stands. Maybe you saw something different that it was more definitive. But to me, I didn't think there was enough there to be able to rule him out. Yeah, clear, maybe not. It, it looked like they got him like uh, in the pectoral region or armpit area and so you know but yeah it, it, it wasn't crystal clear to your point I mean I I, I will uh, stand with you uh, on that you mentioned the nature of these extra inning losses and how you can kind of do nothing wrong but still give up the walk-off run or the game-winning run and we did have that in a lot of ways in this game on Friday night Kyle Finnegan in the bottom of the tent uh, he allowed a run unearned recorded one out uh, issued an intentional walk got an out and it gave up the walk-off single but it was just one out opposite field RBI flare to left field by Lawrence Butler, uh, albeit on a one, two pitch. And that was it. The game was over. Um, some interesting stuff though. I thought with the Nats bullpen in this game. So ultimately four Nats relievers combined to allow one run unearned in three in the third innings, Jordan Weems, bottom of the seventh phase, three batters got two outs. Uh, Robert Garcia, another impressive outing one in a third, perfect innings. And then Hunter Harvey, he tossed a scoreless hitless and walkless bottom of the ninth to preserve the tie. Two swinging strikeouts, two big swinging strikeouts. Second baseman Nassim Nunez committed a fielding error uh, on a leadoff grounder by the uh, Virginia product, Zach Geloff. Uh, Nunez had entered the game as a pinch runner in the top of the ninth. And we know that Nunez is known for his defense, commits his fielding error. But then Harvey really came through back-to-back -back swinging strikeouts of Oakland's numbers four and five batters, J.D. Davis and Seth Brown. For the second and third outs. Uh, I've said to you, I want to see Harvey be more of a strikeout pitcher, given his stuff. Those were two big, impressive strikeouts by him in that spot. And remember, this is his first appearance since getting uh, hit with the line drive back in the hand a couple days ago in San Francisco. So if there was any fear that he was seriously hurt, he looked great uh, coming out here in this one and throwing smoke 98 to get Davis and then went to the splitter to get Brown. And that's with a runner in scoring position 
uh, the air, and then he stole second after that. And as you know, you're sitting there in the press box and you're kind of anticipating what might happen. You're writing your game story as it's going on. I'm thinking to myself that Nunez air might be the thing that costs them the game because he came in to pinch run for Luis Garcia in the top of the inning, obviously didn't score. Now he takes over at second base. That should be a defensive upgrade. And then sure enough, he commits the air, unable to make the play on the first batter out there. And um, that would have been a very tough way for the rookie to uh, be indoctrinated into this game and have it, you know, a loss maybe ha- uh, hung on you for uh, making an error. But Hunter Harvey took care of that, cleaned it up, and that's a good sign to me if he's coming back a couple days after getting hit by the uh, line drive and looks that good out there like he did. All right, a few notes on the Nats. Uh, Riley Adams was the Nats' starting catcher, uh, number seven batter, one for three with a single and a walk. Keeper Ruiz again did not start. He has not played in a game since this past Monday, has been dealing with illness. Usually a guy is sick. You miss a game, maybe two. Uh, this has been more than that. Uh, is, is he doing all right? He seems to be doing better, yeah. So I, he thought he was doing better. He told them he was doing better on Wednesday, and that's why they sent Drew Millis back to Rochester. They had the third catcher here just for the day. It had nothing to do with Ruiz being sick. They sent him back, and then on the off day Thursday, he got sick again and spent the whole day in his hotel room with flu-like symptoms. And before the game, seeing him in the clubhouse, he did not look very well at all. And you're thinking, like, man, if they could have uh, gone back and done that over again, they would not have sent Drew Millis back. They would have kept him around because Riley Adams was their only healthy catcher for this game. And if anything had happened to him, it was going to be Ildemar Vargas uh, behind the plate. But then during the game, I noticed um, because Riley Adams needed time to get his gear back on because he had hit the previous inning, Cabert Ruiz was the one who went out and warmed up the pitcher between innings. So that said to me, okay, that's a good sign. Uh, Davey said afterwards he was feeling a lot better. I saw Cabert in the clubhouse. He had his uniform on and seemed to be doing okay. Um, They better hope he is because it's a quick turnaround, as I said, Saturday. You don't normally want to start Riley Adams a day game after a night game. Uh, So the hope would be that Ruiz is ready to play. I don't think they're bringing Millis back as far as I know. So it's either Ruiz healthy enough or Adams is going to catch a day game after a night game. Uh, on a day that's supposed to be cold and rainy all day as well. We did get that anticipated pitching move on Friday. Uh, The Nats recalled reliever Amos Willingham from AAA Rochester. But as we know, another move is going to be coming because the Nats are going to need another starting pitcher given uh, the absence of Josiah Gray. Now, Davey Martinez did give you a Josiah Gray update prior to the game on Friday. Uh, What did Davey have to say? It was good news there. Um, He has full range of motion already in the arm, so that's a great sign. He's not throwing yet anything like that. But they can, I guess, start the rehab process. And, um, you know, this isn't going to be a a case where he just has to be shut down for a a long uh, amount of time. So that's good uh, on that front. There were some other injury updates. Uh, Stone Garrett is starting a rehab assignment, finally, ready to play at AA Harrisburg. Nick Senzel uh, is probably a day or two away, uh, a few more games at Harrisburg. And I think they're going to bring him up maybe for the L.A. series. We'll see him. Um, so that's a good sign. And then, like you said, they've got to figure out who's going to start. It's either going to be Monday or Tuesday in LA and Jackson Rutledge actually took a line drive off what it looked like his right ankle or foot somewhere in that, um, on Thursday and was down in a lot of pain and had to be helped off the field. And I asked Davey if he had any news on, uh, on Rutledge today. And he said he had not gotten any update yet. I don't know how to interpret that as in, well, it's not a big deal, so they haven't told me anything, or it is a big deal or potentially a big deal, and we're waiting on results of something like that. So if Rutledge was supposed to be the guy to be called up uh, to face the Dodgers, uh, that would probably be in doubt right now. Maybe it's possible if he's okay, but that might be very much in doubt, at which point, what exactly do you do? You cannot call Yohan Adon back up unless he is replacing somebody who's been injured. Uh, So we may be looking at somebody like Mitchell Parker making his Major League debut at Dodger Stadium next week. Uh, hopefully we'll learn more in the next day or two. And by the way, for those who don't know this, the Nats have this series at Oakland, then the series at the Dodgers, then the uh, five-year anniversary World Series championship celebration series against the Houston Astros, and then play the Dodgers again. The Dodgers are at Nationals Park after the Astros, so kind of a quirk in the schedule. Two out of the next three series uh, are against the mighty Dodgers. So with Josiah Gray, 
when is it reasonable to expect them back, assuming that this situation is what we think it is, and that is not as serious as it could have been? I mean, do you think mid-May is realistic? Do you think sooner than that? It could be. You know, my sense is that we're talking weeks as opposed to months with that, which is a good thing. The, the, the key part is when is he able to start throwing again? Because if there is any real delay in that, you run the risk now of kind of having to start all over again and build his arm back up. And now he's got to throw long toss and then bullpen session and then live hitters and then go on a minor league rehab assignment. So if he can in the next, I'd say, week or two begin throwing again, he might be able to avoid that long buildup again because it's still fresh enough. And so maybe he can come back, you know, uh, only a few weeks after that. But if this is a case that he has to wait a while till he can even start throwing, now you're talking about a more prolonged rehab program uh, and throwing program. And that alone could take a month, perhaps after he's finally been cleared to throw. So I think probably this next week is going to be key in that. If he's able to start making progress and maybe pick up a ball, start throwing, that maybe would allow him to come back sooner. I don't think they're worried about this being long term, but you know, with a pitcher, that there are very few arm injuries that allow you to come back in a matter of only a couple of weeks. It's usually going to be at least four weeks, if not more than that. Yeah, and I heard Mike Rizzo on his uh, weekly appearance with the Sports Junkies on Wednesday, and even he said, we're going to take our time with this. So, you know, you say to yourself, well, what does that mean exactly? Uh, even if it is just a few weeks, could it end up being a month, maybe even more than a month? Like, you know, we don't know. And of course, if it ends up being worse or he feels pain again, then like all bets are off uh, when he might be back. You know, the Nats, we talked about this last season, right? Enjoyed remarkable health when it came to in-season health with the rotation and also enjoyed pretty good health with position players. You know, there were some guys who got hurt, Victor Robles, Stone Garrett later in the season. But by and large, last season was a good injury season in terms of the injury luck. You think about this season already, you have the Josiah Gray situation. You have Victor Robles again injured. You had what happened with Nick Senzel. Uh, you have the situation that uh, you have, you have, you began the season with guys like Cade Cavalli and Mason Thompson and Jose A. Ferrer out. Uh, you know, you have this Cade Ruiz illness. You had Jesse Winker have to leave a game due to illness. It, it feels like the injury slash illness gods aren't on the Nats side this season, at least so far, uh, like the gods were last season. Yeah, and I think everybody came into the year knowing there was a good chance that was going to be the case. You know, it, it, they were lucky last year when it came to that kind of stuff. And so far, they're maybe a little less so. Um, and it's the reason why they wanted, especially from a pitching standpoint, to have more depth. They believe they have it. But, you know, if Rutledge got hurt, that's your number one depth option. All of a sudden, he's not available. So that could come back to haunt them. Um, we'll see. It, it's a long road. They only used eight starting pitchers last year. They've already used six. They're probably going to have their seventh here uh, within the next few days. Uh, I'll be real interested to see it come season's end, how many starting pitchers do they use? It could you know, most likely it's going to be in the double digits. You just hope it's not too many more than 10 or 11. Yeah, we also had C.J. Abrams missing multiple games with his uh, pinky situation. So um, the injury ailments, the ailments are uh, piling up here early for the Nats, although nothing seems too serious, which is good. Uh, all right. Happy birthday, Brent. Uh, here's to watching many more Nationals games together. Much love from Linda. Uh, and we are told that uh, Brent and Linda plan their spring vacation around the uh, Nats California road trip. So great. Happy birthday, Brent. Another shout out. We're getting a good number of these shout outs. Will we have by the end of the season more Nationals victories or more shout outs? That's that's, I think, an intriguing race uh, that's emerging here. Well, if we get one of these every day, then that's a good sign that the, I can't imagine they're going to win enough games to keep up with that. But <laughs> uh, can we get my, what was my prediction? 76 wins. Can we get 77 shout outs? I think we can get 77 shout outs. I don't know if we can reach your 82. That's a high number. That's a high bar to set. Let's challenge everyone out there to give us at least 83 shout outs so Al doesn't you know, have the satisfaction of predicting more wins than shout outs. More shout outs than wins. That is the goal uh, for the listenership of this podcast. Uh, hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email the show Nats chat podcast at gmail.com. We invite you to check out our website natschatpodcast.com in which you can buy a Nats Chat Podcast t-shirt. Uh, all Nationals radio highlights on Nats Chat are courtesy of 106.7 The Fame. For Mark Zuckerman, I'm Al Galdi. We thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast.